I'm speaking with Heidi Trudell, and Heidi has a fantastic Twitter handle, which is what drew my attention to her, Just Save Birds. The website is also called JustSaveBirds.com. And why would a threatened bird species habitat activist kind of podcast want to speak to an architectural consultant? Well, it's a pretty simple answer. Heidi's work centres around encouraging builders, consultants, manufacturers, and just basic homeowners in implementing practices that stop bird strike. And Heidi has been researching the factors that affect bird bird strike. So we're going to talk about that. Welcome to the bird emergency, Heidi, all the way from Michigan, USA. Thank you, Grant. It's good to be here. Um, Heidi, I, I just loved the the Twitter handle. Um, just save birds. How did you How did you get into it? How did you get into this? So, just save birds is actually a reflexive response. One of my friends told me that Dead Birds for Science was too depressing. Uh, So the Facebook group Dead Birds for Science does still exist, um, but Just Save Birds was the marketing uh, approach that we tried to take. I Honestly, in 1992, as a small child, I found a roadkill indigo bunting, which is the bluest creature I'd ever seen before in my life. And just becoming aware of small dead things really opened my eyes and everyone knows the birds hit windows and initially I didn't really think too much of it because it's such a frequent occurrence it's entirely normal everyone knows that it happens Uh, but it turns out once you are the only bird person on a campus as was the case when I went to my college everyone would tell me about birds that they had found next to their dorms, birds they had found by their classes. And so very quickly, I turned into the dead bird girl, which as much as I like live ones, uh, (laughs) this seemed like an area where I could do some research. And uh, yeah, turns out once you start looking, you find a lot of things and you, you can't ever really unlearn that. I've seen a lot of um, crappy American teen college movie and uh, TV dramas with the word weird science kid. Never ever saw weird dead bird girl. <laughs> well, you apparently were not at my college. <laughs> yeah. So from dead bird girl, what what got you more into? Well, how did you end up as an architectural consultant? So. I realized fairly early on that biologists talk to biologists. And even though bird window studies are being done really across the world right now, you don't necessarily have actual biologists paying attention um, to the the far-reaching effects of window impacts. So... You know, these aren't as glamorous as, say, oil spills. They're not isolated incidents that are um, easily, not that oil spills are easily contained, but they're a much broader problem um, than most people can really wrap their, their heads around, honestly. So when you're looking at just the breadth of I'm going to have to cut part of this. <laughs> That's all right. I always do. That's all right. Because um, what I'm trying to get at is that it's just underappreciated. And when you're only talking to other biologists, you know, even if they are taking it seriously, which unfortunately most of them aren't, you know, it, it's kind of an echo chamber. So, um, so does that mean that when you're at college, did you do biology? Is that did yeah. you? So you came out of college as a biologist, but you saw that the the major issue that was at the forefront of your mind 
wasn't really being addressed in the scientific community. Is that how it's, you found I would, it? I would say it's actually being addressed. So, for example, the American Bird Conservancy has done a lot of work on researching what prevents bird collisions. But my entire background historically has been as a biologist. But I realized that I can count bodies all day, every day, and it won't change anything. Um, uh, we've seen yeah. papers published you know, since the late 70s on the topic of bird window collisions and how to prevent it. But it hasn't actually gotten to the people who need to see this and hear this. So there hasn't been a crossover into influencing industry, yeah. is that? So that's the Correct. frustration that you engineers, had. Okay. Yeah, engineers are not required to take any sort of ecology classes. And I think if that was the case, we'd have a very different set of, of architectural standards than what we have right now. So, for example, LEED, Leadership in Energy um, and Environmental Design, LEED buildings are supposed to be the greenest of buildings, and because most of them use more glass than the average construction, they actually do, in large part, kill more birds than a traditionally constructed building would. So that gap and blind spot is where I've been trying to help people figure out how to make buildings both green and not kill birds. All right, well, let's start at the beginning. That's always a good way to begin when we've got to go down a path. What are the major causes of bird strike? So generally, it's reflections because birds are seeing trees or they're seeing sky and they're trying to fly from point A to point B. Also, clear glass. So this would be either clear railings or some glass is actually clear enough that uh, on the corner of a building, a bird will see straight through it and think that it can fly from point A to point B. This is also common with raised walkways connecting buildings in urban areas or bus shelters, train shelters, any of those uh, outdoor wind breaks. And then another thing, if you have windows on opposite sides of a building, so somebody's living room or something, a bird thinks it's seeing straight through to the other side and can fly through what it thinks is a tunnel. And those are the three main visual issues with glass, that, that birds simply can't detect glass in any of those scenarios. And so preventing strikes is simply modifying each of those situations so the birds can see that there's something that they cannot fly between or through. Before we talk about the ways to ameliorate the problem, what what's the magnitude of the problem? Do we know in any kind of reliable way how many birds suffer bird strike? I mean, it, it, can we work? Can we narrow it down to a city or to a country, or is it just? A, or has the work only been done perhaps on isolating bird strike on one building? So per building is highly variable. I've worked on buildings that were 95% brick and still killed about half a dozen birds a year. I've also worked on buildings that were basically giant mirrored boxes in really good habitat um, and had several hundred collisions a year. So breaking it down by building is tricky. And I don't know what work has been done internationally. For North America, it's estimated that about a billion birds a year end up dying due to window strikes. That being said, there is some, being, some work being done in South Korea and Singapore to figure out, since their migrations are, are so different than ours, whether those numbers are similar. But because like South Korea has a lot of glass highway uh, noise barriers, and that's not necessarily the case in the U.S., a lot of those numbers are going to, to change based on just infrastructure. Um, so citywide, it's really hard to tell. Depending on migration pathways, some places um, like Chicago, Cleveland, they're right at the end of a, a long lake in each case. So migration funnels birds to those points. 
which makes those cities especially dangerous. And because they're big cities with bright lights, the light also serves as um, a distraction that that is incredibly (laughs) hazardous for birds. Um, So even places out in the middle of nowhere, I lived in the desert before I moved to Michigan. And when the numbers for a house with no bird feeders are two to 10 birds a year, that's about right. A house with feeders can be well over 30 to 40 birds a year. So all of that varies, but by the time you multiply those numbers for the the houses in your neighborhood, it's pretty staggering. It's, they're astounding numbers, really, when you think, uh, especially thinking just the average home or in the desert, I'm thinking that would mirror a lot of what we encounter in Australia, like fairly fairly dry kind of environments, just average, you know, maybe the three-bedroom, single-level dwelling, barbecue out the back, a couple of cars parked out the front, a couple of big gum trees. Um, What's really interesting is I think the, the COVID-19 lockdown has made a lot of people aware that, no, we weren't actually exaggerating because usually in spring, so I volunteer on the board uh, of a local wildlife rehabilitation center, the Bird Center of Washtenaw County. And usually in spring, they'll have about a dozen birds in rehab due to collisions. This year, it was closer to 40 birds due to collisions because everyone was home to hear the birds hit and get those birds to rehab, at least if they survived. So because people are, are stuck there, you know, they have to hear what's hitting. And usually they would be at work or at school and, and not around to, to hear the birds. A billion birds, that's a, a staggering figure if we're talking worldwide. And that, yeah, and, and with more and more dwellings being built each year and, you know, in most cities, I guess, there are more high-rise uh, buildings going up, more glass being used, the the impact on a on a small population of a migratory species could be really significant. Do, do you know if any of the research work means that the effects are greater on particular groups, particular types of birds? So that's a question that's being worked on by the folks in Cleveland uh, at the Museum of Natural History there. So I do want to jump back for a moment. You mentioned high-rise buildings with more glass. It's kind of counterintuitive, but the average low-rise non-residential building kills about the same number as the average skyscraper. So when you say the average low-rise non-residential building, we're just talking about shops, factories, small warehouses... Yep. Schools, yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. It, yeah. it is counterintuitive, but then I think I lived in a, uh, well, it's a, a rural area, I guess, near a lake, and at certain times of the day we had you know, to take advantage of views and whatnot. We had big glass sliding doors on it leading out to a patio. Now I would hang clothes in the windows, tape them, all, all sorts of things. I bought trees in pots, you know, like advanced plants to put on the patio to try and dissuade them. But at certain times of the day, you could see from the front through to a large window we had over the sink in the kitchen, and that was when we'd hear the bang. And when I think about it, probably 10 or 15 strikes a year that I would know about I'm actually not aware of any of those birds dying before, well, they all sort of recovered to an extent where they flew away. But then they're probably, if they're still dazed and confused, they're probably raptor food. One of the hardest things to tell people is that if you were, say, in a car accident without a seatbelt and you got a concussion, you know, you might walk away from it. But because we have the advantage of supervision and medical attention and not being 
out among lions and tigers and bears, it's much safer for a human. But for a bird with that kind of internal injury, there's nothing to say that a hawk or a cat or something else might get it later. Which is really unfortunate because for one of the buildings that I monitored, we figured out that for the birds that we knew of hitting, there were at least six that were not documented. Which that starts to get into some pretty staggering numbers after a while. All right, let's find some good news out of this story. How how do you approach let's start with let's start with the manufacturers. Who have you approached? You don't need to be specific, but the kind of category of manufacturers. And what can they do? What kind of products are they producing or what are they altering to make the built environment safer for birds? So it's really interesting to talk to the glass industry because the evolution of glass technology is part of why bird collisions have become the the massive issue that they have. Because back in the day, glass was small panes, kind of wavy, not really creating reflections at all because it was so rough and potentially had bubbles. But as sheet glass has, has become one of the staples in construction, um, you know, we've got mirrored coatings. We have all these uh, different ways that we can use glass, be it as an actual window or um, in between floors as a spandrel between the, the windows. We see that architects do want to move beyond just a mirrored box, um, but because so many people are requesting that kind of construction material, they they still want, you know, obviously anyone inside the building needs to be able to look through a clear pane of glass without having their vision obscured. We love daylighting. So when I'm working with industry, you know, they have a base product that is amazing and wonderful and it's very well understood. But because the the current options to prevent bird strikes are on the outside surface and generally acid etch is the most foolproof way to go, it becomes an issue of combining both legislation. So for example, California has a lot of building codes now that require bird safe construction, but also design. So When you have, like, most of the cities in the, the greater Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, even Alameda, they now incorporate bird safe language into their building codes. And glass companies all want to make sure they have at least a few products that meet those standards. Um, because if they don't, then clearly the competition is going to be getting a, a portion of that market cornered. And right now, the the products on the market are largely, so Ornolux is UV-based. They've got uh, kind of a, they say it's a spider web look, but it looks more like sticks to me. But it's a UV coating that's unfortunately on the second surface of the glass. So it's not actually particularly visible to the birds. So Walker Glass has acid etched surface one patterns that are dense enough so that birds don't try to fly between them. Um, but again, that's something that interferes with the human's line of sight. But that is what makes it foolproof for birds. Guardian has a UV product that is Surface One. That's, I think, in testing. You might have to cut that. I'm not entirely sure. You can um, let me. You can let me know. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, most glass companies are trying to figure out a way to address some sort of option for architects that are now becoming aware of this problem. Sorry, we still have fireworks going off in the middle of the day for some reason. <laughs> Shooting them at birds. <laughs> yeehaw! Yeehaw, partner! I've got myself a turkey vulture! 
it's, it's almost fourth of July, so people like it's legal yeah. for them to go off between eleven AM and eleven forty five PM. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know why they do that during the day. But, yeah, yeah, America is great again. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I can't resist. Wow. Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> glass the glass industry wants to make sure that they have a variety of products available that will meet the needs of, of architects who are looking to prevent bird strikes. Um, yeah. Hopefully to meet codes, because these codes are, are becoming more popular across the U.S. So it's one thing to have the product available. It's another thing to have it specified in a building or to have a homeowner choose it without being advised to choose it. Mm-hmm. Um, and design is the key. You, you mentioned that when it comes to glass, that we need clear glass and we need to look at, we need to look at views. I would say we don't need to, but we want to. Uh, we we could live with opaque and etched glass, and the only thing that we would miss out on would, would be standing inside to look at a view. We would have to go outside to look at the view. So that's an interesting point. High performance buildings or net zero buildings often use things like structural shades in front of clear glass because you still get your daylighting, but you cut your glare and you also cut your heating and cooling bills. So when I travel, I take tons of pictures of buildings that are bird safe and inevitably you can look up the architect and read through all of the specs about any given building. And nowhere is it mentioned that it's bird safe just because it has a metal skin that has like a Swiss cheese pattern on it. But a lot of those strategies are in effect bird friendly simply because they are addressing external shading and creating a barrier for birds. So I hope that architects will move more in that direction because high performance buildings and low energy consumption are a great direction to be moving in to begin with, but that accidental effect of helping birds obviously is pretty compelling for me. You might have to start an industry award, the accidentally effective bird strike, uh, <laughs> bird strike, bird strike prevention award, or something like that. Yeah. Get a nice little badge designed, and they can all mm-hmm. hang them on their uh, on their websites. Yeah. <laughs> well, the the other thing is, even when it is written into a building spec it's one of the first things that gets cut because people are looking at bird safe glass as an afterthought and they can save X amount of money by not doing that. But if it's planned in, you know, some of these coatings can cut energy consumption or I'm sorry, not energy consumption. What am I trying to say here? The cost of manufacture so that it's the added cost of the product because the product is costed differently or priced differently for the consumer. Um, So most bird safe glass products are around 25 to 30% more expensive than traditional glass. But if people are planning in, so some of these coatings um, can reduce your solar heat gain by a a measurable amount. So like 10% potentially. And if you are factoring in, these coatings as part of, say, reducing the load on your HVAC system, they're much less likely to be value engineered out at the end. So making it worth keeping is is one of the goals in getting the products into the design phases sooner. So it, 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 apart from having the consumer choose it and having the architect specify it because it meets code, the challenge really is to have more of the design architects and the draftsmen who are doing, or the drafts people who are doing um, working drawings for end user clients to actually be aware of safe design principles. So, are there and have clients that will entertain that? But uh, if not but, best for it. But if if somebody who is creating the drawings from a brief. <clears throat> excuse me, can can implement a bird-safe design without even needing to, to talk about it and still make it a building that appeals to the client. If they're unaware that it's bird-safe 
and it's not a I guess the the point I'm getting to is <laughs> getting too badly <laughs> can uh, it's a difficult topic no well well, uh, well uh, I, I like to look at it from how can we do it rather than how can we force people to do it how can it just happen as a matter of matter of course so can a good designer let's put it this way can a top notch architect or um a building designer Design a bird safe building, implementing bird safe products in a manner that makes it cost effective versus a unsafe building and still have it visually appealing and user friendly and efficient. Is it possible? Yes. Okay. There's the, Simply, so, yes. so that's um, it. Let, let, let's please have less shit designers and more really good ones. Please don't be a shit architect. <laughs> the other thing we can do um, with existing buildings is, you know, there are products designed for retrofits. You don't even have to replace the glass. You can simply either add window films to it, which tends to be the way to go. There's, again, structural shading. You have different elements. So when I say structural shading, I mean... Um, either louvers or lattice works, some sort of chunky outside structure. In some cases, it's sheet metal that has a pattern cut out of it. But you could also have rolling shades, screens, either solar screens or regular screens, various types of netting. But there are a lot of options that people wouldn't necessarily think of as being bird specific and in a lot of ways, they're not. But you can get really artistic with it. And there are products that if you really want it to look like nothing has changed at all, there are, like Solix has a bird safe film that is a very thin gray line, either horizontal or vertical, spaced about every two inches apart. You put that on a building, you back up 20 feet, you really don't notice it, but it cuts bird collisions by you know, a significant amount. So when you approach existing buildings you, know, you don't actually even have to change the design of the building that much you can just tweak a few things granted again it's a fairly expensive thing so people tend to modify them for reasons other than birds but you know it is something that has a very tangible impact especially on employees i want to say it was the vancouver city hall don't quote me on that that ended up spending like 80 grand to redo one side of their building because their employees I don't know how many worked on that side of the building but if you realize that it takes 15 minutes for a person to get back into the flow of work after being interrupted if there's a bird hitting the glass two to three times a day times 30 people who are interrupted by the startling thump noise you know they said that it would pay itself off in two to three years just because of employee productivity is, uh, it's a weird uh, way to look at it, but no, 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 no. You have to. All of these factors should be look looked at. That's the problem with everything that we're doing at the moment. Is that people will only look at the cost of implementing the bird code, but the effects of perhaps energy efficiency and comfort of the residents when we're talking about shading that gets put as an as a different one but if there's an efficiency gain of let's say three percent well you've got to take that off the cost of implementing the bird strike you can't exactly. uh, but the, 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 and I don't... oh there's just too many there's just too many ways to be negative about about implementing solutions there's not enough ho holistic examination of anything anymore. And I don't know that anyone has actually studied the psychological impact of this because... At well, some why, of the why would you? That's soft. Why would you? Just yeah. suck it up, yeah. you know? That's why, why should anyone care that your employees are traumatized because they're finding multiple dead hummingbirds on their lunch break every day? Well, we don't pay them a living wage. Why would we care how they feel? Yeah, yeah, it's tragic. It's really tragic. 
but honestly, hummingbirds are one of the ways that I get non-bird people. I'm doing that in quotes because everyone's a bird person. They just don't know it. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's right. I, Again, like if they're not a bird person, they just haven't met the right bird yet. Hummingbirds tend to reach across most of the biologist, non-biologist boundaries. Because so my research comes largely from Illinois, southern Illinois, closest to St. Louis and southeast Michigan. And so since 2003, I've been tracking whatever collisions that I find. and. It is astonishing how many are hummingbirds. For Illinois, it was close to 20% of the birds that we detected were hummingbirds. For Michigan, it's closer to 16, 17%. But just the amount, we know we're not finding them all. Squirrels eat them like candy. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's warblers, it's thrushes, it's stuff that people have never even heard of. But this is... I think a really valuable bridge for people to get reacquainted with the natural world. Um, assuming that on their lunch break, on their way into work, on their way out of work, you know, they find a hummingbird, a goldfinch, a woodpecker. You know, this is suddenly an opportunity to get up close with something that might have migrated 1500 miles just to end up at their building. People care about cute. So let you know, use it. Absolutely. Although it's frustrating because when people find a live bird, like getting it to a vet or a rehabber is almost the last thing on their mind. If it was a kitten, like they'd be on it. They would know exactly what to do. But because it's a bird, I, I think there's kind of a, a dissonance between, again, if you found a cat or a dog that got hit by a car, you would know what to do immediately. But People are, you know, they assume that the bird is sitting up, so it's probably okay. And then eventually it flew off, so it's maybe fine. But that's not how birds work. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I like to to be a bit kind to people who don't who don't know and might have good intentions. Generally, with a cat or a dog or a guinea pig or a rabbit that you find somewhere, people think, "Oh, that's somebody's cat or dog." There's probably somebody missing that dog, missing that cat, and we have methods in place with chipping and whatnot. That means if it goes to the vet, it will be returned to the owner. That's the I think that's mm -hmm. uppermost in people's mind. I'm not sure most people would even know where their local wildlife rehab centre is, and in a lot of localities there probably isn't one that's close. Yeah. And and I can see the average person, if I drop off a cat and it's been microchipped, I'm not going to have to pay for any treatment that <laughs> is going to offer. Yeah. And I think you, you, you get my point. Uh, dro dropping off a wild bird to a vet, even though we all should do it, I can understand somebody who does not have any discretionary uh, disposable income uh, to, to go, yeah, sure. Seven hundred dollars for the woodpecker? Not a problem. That's a really interesting point. I don't think most people actually know that wildlife rehabbers basically exist on donations alone. At least in the U.S., we oh, have. Oh, cer certainly the case here. I mean, um, iconic species koala hospitals get money, but I'm not sure that any other wildlife rescue services would be able to say, oh, yeah, we don't need any extra money. You know, we're, we're doing fine. I think, yeah. you know, I think they're, you know, a, again, uh, I come back to it all the time. We don't value the wildlife. If we did, we wouldn't have the issues. If, if a building owner was charged $1,100 per dead bird, they very soon would implement policies to stop the dead birds hitting them. And this is the kind of approaches that we don't take. Um, that would be really hard in America because you've got your freedom and all that. I'm free to kill as many birds as I want. And if I want to kill birds with my windows, I'll bloody do it. Sorry. So 
We do have the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which unfortunately has been pretty badly gutted. But if someone were to go out and intentionally kill any of these birds, they could probably be fined, a, I want to say it's a minimum of $500 each. So yeah, actually, oh my God, if I had $500 per bird that I've had in my freezer, I would have retired like freshman year of college. But didn't you understand that they had to change the Migratory Birds Act because all of those birds you had in your freezer have been attacking your freedom for years and it's about time that freedom struck back. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> well, I mean, um, for what it's for what it's worth, and I do need to add the disclaimer here: every bird that I've had in my freezer has been with the state and federal permits required to do that, and they all go to research collections. I- I don't think I doubted doubted that for a second. Uh, but, uh, but some the, people don't know, so the, we need to make that clear. Because anyone, the, literally anyone, can do this with state and federal permission and or you know, being listed as a subcommittee for a research collection. The, the point I was making so flippantly and possibly insultingly is that you had a landmark piece of legislation that somebody who I regard as a buffoon and somebody who is captured by industry has, as you use the term, gutted it. And all the terms like green tape and uh, all these blockages for development and job-destroying regulations, you know, as a society... As a society in general, we just do not value wildlife. And until that changes... It's also incredibly distressing to see that the the one thing I have ever agreed with the current president on is the wind farm issue. And that's because not enough research goes into the appropriate siting of industrial-scale wind farms. Yeah, Um, and... And there are ways to get green energy, but putting gigantic wind turbines in the middle of Lake Erie is not it. Yeah, and and I actually interviewed someone yesterday who, so that'll come out soon, but referring to the danger of wind farms just for raptors in Australia. Oh, yeah. Now, the the problem is now that all of the major energy companies are heavily invested in wind turbines so that even though we've got a massive coast in Australia, no one's no one's seriously looking at investing in wave energy or any of the other technologies that mean that we could still get the power. It could it's still be... It's not flashy. It's, it's not iconic. It doesn't have a silhouette that sells. Yep. Yeah. And I actually, I worked on a wind farm for three years as a body counter, as it were. So it was twice as many bats as it was birds. And... While I was not surprised at the number of raptors we found, I was surprised with the number of waterfowl and songbirds that we got. And that wind farm was in the middle of nowhere. Abilene, Texas is not on anybody's wish list for uh, any sort of ecological interest. Um, Okay, well, that's a point that's worth hammering home. I'll certainly look into that more and try and find appropriate people to talk to about the alternatives because... Again, because of lobbies and the concentration of the ownership of the of the people who produce the power, we're captured again. We're trapped, and there there seems to be no willingness to look outside the box and solve any of the issues. Um, Because you can't make a ton of money off of people with solar panels on their houses. Well. That's, again, the problem about being captured. I mean, the the whole COVID thing has I, – I feel like it's given us the opportunity to free the way we think about things. And, and the whole reason this podcast is called The Bird Emergency is because it's almost too late, almost. And we – ah. Oh, oh. I don't know. What, I don't know. I, I want to be hopeful every day. I really want to about this. But then you, you see the forces that, and I don't think they're man, man, malevolent in most cases. I think a lot of people are willfully ignorant. But it's 
we've just invented a structure where it's so easy for them to say, I don't know, or it's not my job to fix it. Well, it's everyone's job. Yeah, I think it's the same thing with literally everything that seems like a good idea at the surface. Like trap meter release for feral cats. You know, it looks great when you see the the first line of print, you know, not killing cats. You know, who actually wants to kill cats? Nobody that I'm aware of. But then you flip it around and by the time you dig deeper, trap meter release is an absolute disaster especially for cats because they've you know, basically just been dumped outside with some food and water and they're expected to live somehow healthy lives. Um, oh, also a very controversial point that I like pointing out. A lot of the outside cats that are credited for killing birds might actually be playing with birds that have hit windows and are stunned. Yep. That makes sense. Makes perfect sense. But we. It's really unfortunate. Yep. Although I, I'm one of those crew that think if you have a cat, you have a responsibility to make sure that it's not killing my wildlife. So yeah. keep it in sight. And if you want it to be outside, build a run. Build I don't, a catio. Yep. Yes. And, and sorry, I don't care how much it costs. Bye. Do that instead of putting a spa on your back deck. Yeah. It's all about choices, people. It's all about choices. Yeah. And if you can't actually keep your cat happy indoors, then either step up your enrichment game or maybe you don't have a cat. Yep. That's the other choice. Don't have one. You know. yeah. um, this is why I have a ton of house plants. I've never once had to clean a litter box. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't have a pet because I like outside things. <laughs> my my housemate has a dog, and and but I'm continually getting upset with other dog owners. I take the dog for a walk who don't control their dogs. I don't think you've got a right for your dog to upset and annoy my dog. <laughs> you know. So yeah. anyway, that's enough of that's enough of Grumpy Grant. All right, enough Grumpy Grant. Heidi. Uh, Let's let's talk more about you. The podcast is basically about about birds and bird people. I think you've earned earned your stripes as a bird nerd, as we like to say. So let's say uh, we've worked out too in the course of producing the the podcast that uh, bird people are placed somewhere along the spectrum, the bird nerd spectrum. So let's work out where you fit. Okay. Um, when did you work out that you were a, a bird person? Was it way before you became the crazy dead bird girl? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I liked birds from at least the time I was three or four until I got my first pair of binoculars when I was, I think, 13. But that gap in between was focused mostly on like cockatiels, doves, lovebirds, Monk parakeets actually got me into wild bird watching, so that was a, a weird transition. Now, monk parakeets, tell me about them because I I was under the impression that you guys um, hated your parrot so much that you extincted it, the Carolina parakeet. So, a monk parakeets a ex escapee with a population in North America. So monk parakeets have firmly established in Chicago, Houston, Dallas, Florida, New Orleans. You know, pick a major city. There's probably at least a nest in there somewhere. The colony nearest my house in Houston when I was growing up, we tracked down the fellow who said that he released them, apparently you know, 20 years earlier. His wife didn't like how loud they were, so they let them go in their backyard. But they had a palm tree, so for them, the next... 20 some odd years, they've had monk parakeets in their backyard and surround sound rather than just being loud in the house. So, so yes, there's a definitely a love hate relationship with monk parakeets in the US. Yes. And let, let's just put in a, a word of, well, a plea really. If you're sick of your cage bird, please do not release it. That's a very bad thing to do. Yes. 
If you don't like your cage bird, take it somewhere where it can be rehomed. Start with your vet. Start with your vet. That's a good. There are parrot rescues for a reason. Yeah, and and it doesn't mean it doesn't matter if it's a duck, or if it's a finch, or if it's a parrot, or if it's a bloody harpy eagle. Don't put it out in the wild. Okay, now we worked out that that you're a young, uh, very young bird convert. When you're a bird watcher for pleasure, yes. What's the field guide that you choose to use? Big Sibley, hands down across the board. Have you migrated to apps yet? I'm kind of old school, you know. When eBird first started, I I was not really keen on switching over. I finally did get a smartphone a couple of years ago, finally. But I just, I can't, like, intrinsically, my, my muscle memory for thumbing through field guides is still pretty accurate. And I'd rather go without a field guide than actually use a, a phone app because notes and sketches are my jam. I'm, I'm old school in that way. Now, for those of us who are not in North America, what's the Sibley Field Guide's actual title? Oh, goodness. That's a really good question. It's always just Big Sibley for the rest of us. There's Eastern Sibley and Western Sibley, but the big one, because I lived in Texas, covered all of them, plus South Texas. It, it, is it something Sibley. as simple as birds of birds of birds of North America? I think yeah, yeah. that's the one. Now, what what do you like about it? Why have you chosen to use that one? So my first guide was I want to say Peterson's Texas, but I ended up switching pretty quickly to uh, the National Geographic uh, field guide to the birds of North America. I like the maps, the art, just the the general context. But Sibley takes it a step further and pulls the silhouettes like Peterson had and like strips down the birds of... So there's too much confusing detail almost in some of the the National Geographic guides. I think it's a black chin sparrow has a lot of stuff drawn around its cheeks that you think are markings, but the way it's drawn, it's actually just supposed to be shade. So when you see it in the field, you're like, this doesn't look right, but otherwise the description matches. Whereas in Sibley, it's just a pastel blob of sparrow with just the field marks that you need being emphasized. And that's why I I lean away from guides that use photos, because you're looking at an individual bird. And with a guide, you want a a more general... uh, a feel for what a bird is. Then again, I, I also learned my shorebirds at Bolivar Flats with, you know, this sandpiper feels a little bit more slender than that sandpiper, and the posture of this one is a little more hunched. So it's not a hard, you know, the supercilium does this and this. Um, it's, it's more of a feel. And I think Sibley does a really nice job capturing that in silhouettes and especially flight silhouettes. Sibley does a great job with those. All right. Good job, Sibley. <laughs> now, what's, uh, when you're out birding, what's your, your your favorite piece of equipment or the piece of equipment that you can't go without? I mean, I'm, again, kind of a minimalist. Binoculars, pretty much. Sunglasses and hat, but binoculars. And are you a brand loyalist when it comes to binoculars? No, I am not. Because I have an IPD of like 52 millimeters. So anything that fits my face and will not tear a retina, I am a fan of. Very uh, I, I, no, I, I did actually tear a retina in 2014. Oh. Turns out that Nikon Monarchs don't fit my face very well. Okay. So no offense to IPD of 55 and above, but uh, if it doesn't fit my face, then I can't use it. I am, however, a major fan of Zeiss because their minimum IPD across their entire range does actually fit my face. But otherwise, mini binoculars are fantastic. Yeah, I was going to ask, is it difficult to find an appropriate pair? But you've obviously found a solution that, that works, a complete range. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I found that Opticron also has a really nice set of, of small IPD binoculars. But hands down, Zeiss has fantastic glass and they fit. So. Okay. Well, well, well done, Mr. Zeiss. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite bird? Oh, that, that is a loaded question. Atwater's prairie chicken was my first, like, really hard bird crush. I still love them to pieces, but not being near them makes it really hard to stay involved. Nighthawks and forget birds and anhingas are, are probably my, my next faves. But mm, that is a really tough question. Oh, uh, well, it's that's really unfair. That's it. You. <laughs> Hard hitting journalism here at uh, at the bird emergency, and no doubt about it. When you go bird watching, are you a list keeper? Are you a ticker and flicker, or is it just the immersive experience that you're after? Well, this is going to give away my southern bias. In Texas, I had the luxury of listing. It was fantastic to just get out and see diversity and. To me, a good day was like 80 species and above. And then I moved to the desert and I realized that a good day could be like 20 species and above. Michigan feels a lot like the desert, honestly, but it's strange. I have to you know, slow down and appreciate the, the quality versus the quantity, which, again, it's really weird to think about, you know, when I first started bird watching, my mentors were folks who would do big days and like just really they were listers. So shifting the emphasis from go to like, oh, stop and watch it build a nest uh, has, has been different. But now I see bird watching as kind of a refreshing way to not be looking at dead stuff. Except spring migration is really sad. Because I'll be out there in Northwest Ohio with gobs of people staring at tons of warblers everywhere. And I, I can't help my filter. I'm over here like, oh, wow, male black throated blue warbler. Haven't seen one of those since I put one in the freezer in September. Like, <laughs> going through the entire slew of, of happy live birds. It's like, oh, Bay breasted warbler. You know, we've only had one of those in the freezer last season. Like mm. <laughs> <laughs> therapy in, in some regard, but in another way it's really depressing because I'm like, man, the next time I'm gonna see these birds is in the fall when they're in a Ziploc baggie. <laughs> well, I I usually ask people what their what their favorite place to go bird watching is, but I but I feel like I should be asking you where's your favorite place to find dead birds? <laughs> The library. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's that's real. Um, when I lived in the desert, people would come visit. They'd be like, "Oh, I need to take you to this park. It has a little natural spring. It's great." And here, I'm like, "Oh, do you want to come see my library? We can walk around the back of it and find it." But <laughs> if you're lucky, they're dead. If you're lucky, they hit and they sprawled out and they didn't suffer. If you're not lucky, they'll be curled up with their their feet gripping something, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. when it gets you. <laughs> yeah, and I think we, I, I think many of us will be familiar with that the the closed feet, the clenched feet, and also the bobbing head, the listless bobbing head, which uh, yeah. Uh, is oh, that's, okay. Quick tangent. So, so many people will say that you know, the bird died of a broken neck. Birds have so many vertebrae that there could be absolutely nothing wrong and its neck would still be incredibly floppy. Hmm. Dan Clem, who pioneered all of the window collision research, I want to say he did x-rays of white-throated sparrows back in the day and like 3% of them had broken necks. The rest of them, it's you know, internal hemorrhaging and hmm. other various terrible ailments. But yeah, broken necks. Not how birds tend to die when no, they hit a window. No, I mean they—they they are just dinosaurs with feathers, and you know exactly. Like, and if owls can turn their heads all the way around, like other birds don't get that credit because they're not doing it all the time. Yeah. But 
Yeah. Well, most of the waiters can certainly look back over their other shoulder. So, yeah. For sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I don't think we'll. I don't think we'll, we'll find out more about where the best places to find dead bo- dead birds are. I think the. I think we know the answer. It's anywhere. It's anything anywhere. with a window is yeah. fair game. Anything. Yeah. yeah, it's it. It's really important work that you're doing. Even though you imagine going through college being called the dead bird girl. That prom must have been terrible. Did you have to? <laughs> did you have to go as a goth? So I actually feel worse for my sister because we went to the same college and before I got there, she was just her. And then I got there and suddenly she became not just bird girl's sister, but dead bird dead girl's bird sister. Girl sister. <laughs> she doesn't even like birds. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, Heidi, thanks for spending this time with us. It's great to get a bit of international flavour on the bird emergency. It's been too easy to be Australian focused, but of course, the issues confronting birds are global and uh, I hope to present lots more global stories. Heidi, I hope you will send me some of that research that you mentioned, maybe Singapore and and Korea and, and your research so we can link to it and people can you know maybe follow it up and get interested and and work out what is being done in their local area i'll certainly be looking at what australia is doing and what perhaps they they're doing in in the eu because they're often leaders in this kind of kind of stuff i can i have the benefit of being able to see you on on video and you're shaking your head and making teensy weensy signs at me so maybe the eu have not got woke on the rsvb uh, still has hawk silhouettes on their website oh well. <laughs> uh, okay well i'm actually, actually talking to someone from the royal society for the protection of birds in a short while i will raise this issue with them and find I would out. love to talk to them. Give them my information, please. <laughs> okay. Well, I will actually suggest that they make contact. I have no idea who's doing any kind of work over there, but between then and now, I will find out and make some suggestions, and hopefully we can be the bird emergency bridge. So, Sounds good. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's been illuminating. If you've been listening on your browser, you can subscribe on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Podchaser, Castbox, Ghana, Deezer, Stitcher, and countless other platforms. If you like what we're doing, please share or review the show. I look forward to joining you next time.